Welcome to episode 259 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Joining me in a moment is Kate Buth, Executive Director at iMag, to talk about cross-border e-commerce delivery. Joining me on the line is Kate Muth. Kate is Executive Director at iMag, the International Mailers Advisory Group. Kate, we're going to talk about advanced electronic data and why it's really important, what's happening at the moment with regards to cross-border e-commerce via the post and all that sort of stuff. Why don't we just start with a quick refresher, though? The electronic advanced data, or whether you call it EAD or AED, it's the same thing we're talking about here. It came to the fore a couple of years ago. Can you just remind everybody why, what led to EAD being back on the agenda? Yes, right. So there's a few things going on. Of course, the the UPU was trying to get everybody sort of, you know, providing advanced electronic data to posts, providing it to each other. The global postal model, I believe it's called, was set to take effect January 1 of 2021. And so countries would post would provide advanced data, the seven plus one data. Here in the US, uh, things really amped up a few years ago with the passage of the Stop Act, which was an attempt to try to um, try to stop or stymie um, the movement of opioids and illicit narcotics through the postal international uh, mail stream. And of course, uh, advanced data helps with detecting counterfeit and and, uh, prohibitive goods and things like that. So customs authorities use it for risk assessment. And um, I would say in January of 2021, there was a real heightened attempt to try to get everybody, uh, at least all of the developed countries, to provide uh, 100% advanced data. But we know that um, some countries are behind, of course. And uh, here in the U.S., for, for especially for my members who do a lot of export outbound shipping from the U.S. to other countries, the U.S. Postal Service really stepped up its enforcement of what we call export compliance. When we spoke, oh gosh, I can't even exactly remember when it was, we were talking about the implementation of all of this and how what would happen if shipments were detected at the border and if they didn't have the right data. So what's happening right now with any shipments or any whether it's an individual parcel or however it might be worked out, what's happening with 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 shipments that have either inaccurate EAD or missing or incomplete data? What's what's the current status? Yeah, I think we we did talk about a year ago, and I just you know for the record, I do know a few other topics, but it's nice for us to <laughs> <laughs> advance data. This isn't my entire life, but uh, you're right. There last year we were sort of ramping up and gearing up for the implementation date. The U- in the U.S. under the STOP Act, we were waiting at that time, or maybe it had just come out, uh, Customs and Border Protection, which is our customs authority, had to put out a uh, final rule, on uh, which essentially, you know, when Congress passes into a bill into law, um, there's implementing rules that go around it, and the agency responsible uh, for implementing puts out a final rule. Well, we were waiting on that. It ended up being an interim final rule, and it granted what we call, I think, um, informed compliance. It granted essentially a grace period of about a year so that the the Postal Service could work and the State Department um, and Customs could work with other countries to ensure that they were getting closer to 100%. So I don't know um, that here in the U.S. we are sending things back just at the moment. We're still in that grace period. Um, in other countries, we are... So what we're working on then again with the post service on the outbound side is for for mailers and shippers for in a particular my members who are the service providers consolidators is to ensure that they are providing 100% advanced data so that it's not even leaving the country uh, without that so it doesn't get to the destination country find out that it's missing something and have to come back and that's really what the effort has been here um, in the United States on the outbound side is to ensure that the post service is collecting 100% data before it even you know otherwise they will not accept it they will send it back if it's missing something they're sending it back to the ship so is it not even leaving the country is that the current situation that's the current situation here, correct? So uh, my next question was going to be why, from a shipper's perspective, why is it important to get the EAD right? I think we might already have the answer there. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think that's a really important, you know, issue. That this has been, it's been a challenge. It's been a difficult. And, and I'll just want to note, Ian, that here in the U.S., at least for my members, we were going from something like ninety percent AED to close the gap to a hundred percent. 
So we were already providing the the, the shippers, um, bulk shippers or commercial shippers were already providing a very robust amount of data. But, you know, there's still we had to close that gap. And it's been difficult because stuff can't stack up at the international service centers. And I think if you read the um, Office of Inspector General management alert, you saw that at times it's because the Postal Service's um, internal systems, which is the sort of their tracking systems and their clearance systems, there can be a latency, there can be a bit of a lag time. And so it will look like, oh, we didn't get the data. And then they'll send the shipment back. They'll send the receptacle back to the um, to the consolidator or to the shipper. And they're like, well, what? I don't. what's missing? Well, nothing's missing. It was just this lag between the Postal Service kind of moving it through its internal IT system. So we've been working with the Postal Service uh, on that, too, to try to reduce even that from happening. But um, as I said, we want to get it right because you don't want it to get to the destination country and then have it come back. And, and then one other thing I just want to note there is, it, you know, you talk about collecting 100% AED and there's sort of a theoretical, you know, there's a plan and, and it kind of in theory, it sounds like, okay, we got to get to 100%. But if, if something sits at the International Service Center waiting to be cleared or if it goes back and then it has to come be reentered again, I mean, there's a customer on both ends of this that are having a bad experience. You have the shipper and you have the end recipient. And so I think that's the piece of it that people are, are trying to keep in mind too, is that, you know, somebody is waiting a really long time for a package. You mentioned that prior to the introduction of the STOP Act, uh, there was already movement at a global level to improve the uh, the quality and the compliance with regards to EAD on international shipments going through the mail. What was the driver for that back then? Was it just about getting better data to streamline exactly what you were just talking about to get to to, to iron out those bottlenecks? I don't know if you can iron out a bottleneck, but I think you know, <laughs> clear the bottlenecks. I suppose is a better way of putting it, right? So, is was it about that, um, or was it about you know custom c- collecting customs duties at the other end? What sort of what's what were the drivers before we we sort of had this acceleration thanks to the Stop Act in the USA? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a few things. I certainly think for customs authorities, it's all about risk assessment and how do you, you know, there's e-commerce just exploded. We have massive amounts of um, lightweight and, and sort of low value packets and, and packages coming in, sort of overwhelmed customs authorities in many countries. And in some countries, and especially like in the US, it's, a, it's security and, and, and helping customs with their risk assessment using technology to do that. Uh, other countries, I think, in the European Union, you know, there's a, um, a tax uh, implication. Now you have the value added tax being applied to all low, you know, the de minimis removed. So it's sort of I, I've seen presentations where it's for a variety of reasons, and it's to re- reduce counterfeits as the um, marketplaces and platforms really exploded. Counterfeits have increased enormously. So for each custom authority, it may be a variety of reasons. And because so much of the lightweight, uh, low value goods moved through the postal network, it, it was time to kind of bring up the, to, to have postal and customs clearance be relatively the same, you know? And uh, I think this is really where the, the action has been is to use technology and to use advanced data to try to, uh, to, try to make that uh, an easier process for customs authorities, which then is a benefit for shippers and recipients as well. And so it's becoming a level play, playing field in terms of where, when it comes to collecting customs data and, and transmitting data in advance of the shipment landing in the destination country. Does so it mean that we've got a, I don't want to say level playing field, but I can't think of a better <laughs> phrase for it, between the postal operators and the private carriers now. The burden is equal. No matter what network you're sending it through, whether it's the postal network or a private network, uh, you're going to have the same requirements to send to, to provide and send that data for every shipment. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately uh, the goal. I mean, the private express industry has wanted that for many years, has said it's been a little bit, uh, burden has certainly been heavier on them. That's been, you know, where they've uh, sort of argued that uh, the playing field has not been equal. But I do think it is leveling out. And and you have you do see that also um, in the European Union with the changes, you know, with the ICS2 uh customs clearance system or advanced data system. And then, of course, around, you know, a revenue protection perspective, they're going to be collecting um, VAT on on all of those low value goods as well. Let's then talk about how that data is being used. Uh, 
we, well, we just talked about how it's being used. I guess the question I really have is, are posts and customs using the data correctly? I mean, are they re- really using the data as it's intended to, to be, whether it's detecting counterfeits, whether it's collecting duties or streamlining? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think to us, uh, and this was in our comments to the the rulemaking from Customs and Border Protection, I don't know that it's clear that more data equates to more effective enforcement. It's it's not entirely clear to us how the data is being used or how much of it's being used. And I know we've talked about this in the past. So let's say you're uh, we you know we were collecting eighty percent, and there are, and and customs authorities are only using one percent of that data. Okay, now we're working really hard to get to a hundred percent. Are they using any more of the data? So one of the things we've asked, at least in the U.S., is for some metrics around how the data is being used and is it at all effective, especially in reducing opioid, um, you know, the movement of opioids and illicit narcotics through through the mail, because that was the intention of the STOP Act. I don't actually know how it's being used in other countries. I don't know if the customs authorities are using it. Uh, I Well, I guess we do know a little bit because we did have some things come back from um, our members earlier in the fall had some things coming back from Ireland. Uh, Irish Customs was rejecting items that didn't have HS codes, and that's not even a requirement in the um, in the UPU, you know, sort of global agreement. Uh, HS codes are not required, but EU authorities are starting to require them. So, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect as well. Like, if the rules aren't the same for the UPU uh, agreement as it is uh, from EU Customs authorities it's causing a little bit of confusion um, entering into those countries. So in part, I mean, given that e-commerce is a, a global phenomenon and we we buy routinely from other countries, sometimes we know we're buying from another country, sometimes we don't. If we're buying via a marketplace, we don't know where that where that individual item we're buying is coming from. Um, so it, it sounds to me like there really needs to be greater harmonisation of the requirements and clarity of those requirements. I, I, I know not, not that long ago, you know, one, one European nation decided to independently you know, lower its, uh, the, the threshold to zero for VAT collection, and that had a tremendous impact on e-commerce into and out of that country. So uh, well, there is a, a need, by the sounds of it, for, for greater clarity and understanding of, of what the data is, what data is needed or what the data is used for. And and if I can put on my customer hat for a moment, Kay, I know I try to be, you know, take a fairly neutral standpoint, but I can speak as a customer, I hate it. I hate it when I get a parcel and I'm told I have to pay more in order to receive the parcel. I have some real horror stories I could share. I'm not going to share them today, <laughs> but um, I had to pay a three-figure sum to receive a packet of nuts. <laughs> Right. I hope they were really good nuts. I hope they, they were. were really good. Look, they're great. They're fantastic. They're um, hazel, uh, not hazelnuts. They're um, macadamia nuts. So, yeah. right, not talking right. about just peanuts. <laughs> but I didn't pay <laughs> peanuts to receive something that shouldn't have even been subject to uh, you know, any sort of customs duty. Anyway, this is probably not the forum for me to air my own personal grievances, Kate. <laughs> but I think it's illustrative in terms of um, a couple of things. One is that that came through the postal network, um, whereas shipments that I receive via a really big e-commerce website, they are never subject to any taxes at the doorstep. It's always worked out in advance. So when uh, this is a conversation, <laughs> I, was, I started this conversation before we hit record, Kate, when I was talking about how one day posts will wake up and realise that they're irrelevant. This is the opinion of Ian Kerr, by the way. Posts have the uh, in danger of waking up one day and realizing that they're irrelevant. And in part, it's because private operators are doing some things better. And one of them is, in this case, having complete control over the entire customs experience so that me as a, an individual consumer doesn't have to worry about uh, the you know, having to pay taxes at the doorstep. Anyway, Kate. I know there, there a question in there? No. There's no <laughs> question in there. That's just a rant. And I, 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 sort of... I, I think you hit on something quite right, which is, in, and I kind of what I alluded to at the start, that there's, 
you know, there's strategies and there's plans, there's requirements, but there's also a customer at the other end that doesn't want to pe- get surprised by a tax or a duty and, and ruin the customer experience. And, you know, we have it a little bit different here. If you're sending something into the United States, the de minimis is $800. Uh, it, it's meant to try to, you know, speed e-commerce through. But in the United States, there is a real movement among uh, among legislators to to sort of take a closer look at what's going on in the marketplaces with counterfeits, and so I, and requiring even more data for things coming in eventually, even on the commercial side uh, through the the three twenty one pilot that um, Customs and Border Protection is doing. So there is a real focus on this, and and ultimately, though, while you're doing all of this, the customer has to be kept in mind. You know, I'm sort of reminded of that. Uh, seen and I don't know if you saw the movie um School of Rock where he says something like they forgot about a little thing it's called the music and I feel like we forget about a little thing it's called the customer and that really is ultimately what um has to be kept in mind that if you keep alienating customers or giving them a bad experience they're going to find some other way to get it and it and you're right it may not be the post or their usual provider and this is a, a recurring theme which is it's the customer or the consumer is the generator of these parcels so when I go on online and buy something, it's me generating the parcel and receiving it. When any of you listening to this go online and buy a parcel, well, as we just said, you're generating your own parcels and you expect to get the service that you pay for, not to get slugged with an extra fee or not to find that it's been delayed at the International Gateway or things like that. Oh, gosh, International Gateway delays. Another thing that drives me insane, absolutely insane. However. As we've heard before from um, even from uh, Sharik at Assurity, he said, you know, the da- it's all about the data. Yep. It's all about the data. So, so Kate, just coming back, though, to um, a couple of things we've just that we've discussed during this um, interview so far. What, you know, we've talked about the customer experience. Uh, we've talked about the data and potential bottlenecks and all that. One of the things we haven't really talked about, though, is the whole procedure of, let's say, a parcel's going in or a shipment's going into the USA and the data is not correct. I mean, where is the shipment getting rejected? Where should it get rejected? What's the best way that this could be handled with and that rem, that has a real customer centric focus, if I can put it that way? Right, exactly. So one of the things that we had requested uh, in our or suggested in our comments um, to Customs and Border Protection on the interim final rule is that it the final rule explicitly allow the postal service to refuse shipments before loading even on the um, airplane in the uh, origin country. So in other words, it doesn't get here. And then they have to say, oh, we don't have all the data and send it back. I mean, there's a cost to that, of course. Uh, you have to now, now it's shipped you know, back and forth. There's, there's a carbon footprint to that. And there's also a customer experience portion of that. So we would like that to be explicitly stated that if it hasn't been loaded uh, you know, if the if the EAD hasn't been received or if there's something wrong with it, uh, it can be stopped before the shipment even gets on the plane or be fixed or corrected, whatever the right uh, solution is. Well, I'm told that the, the big saying at the moment is data is the new oil. So in this case, you know, without we, we can use data not just to improve the customer experience but also to prevent unnecessary emissions, prevent unnecessary kilometres travelled by shipments. You know, there's no point in them being shipped halfway across the world. Just to get rejected because some of the data is incomplete seems absurd, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, most of our members and most of those of us that kind of live and breathe this stuff would say that let's use technology, let's use data to find the solutions. Um, and I and I do think that's the direction we're headed. Some countries are going to be farther along than others, and sort of how do we bring along um, and help you know help get everyone compliant and get those countries maybe that don't have the robust systems and IT solutions, bring them along. So then we aren't seeing transshipments through countries where maybe, you know, they have a waiver for on the stop act or something like that. And that's another important piece here in the US is that a lot of countries were granted waivers and there's low volume and and less shipments and all of that. But eventually we kind of have to get everybody up to speed so that you don't have to grant so many waivers. And there isn't a temptation for the bad guys to send things through countries uh, that have been granted those waivers. Now, Kate, more broadly, just looking forward, uh, what do you see as being some of the big things that are happening in the 
in the, in the cross-border and the global postal world in the next, next 12 months? So any, anything on your radar at the moment do you think is going to be one of the big issues of the, of the next 12 months? Um, I think certainly this will be, you know, advanced data will be a topic. We will see, uh, I'm hoping we get some international airlift back. You know, that remains the service challenges of moving things around the world with the lack of uh, international passenger lift. And then all of the things happening in the EU around the um, the VAT collection. And we just saw a circular from La Post where they're now, uh, or in 2022, they're going to be requesting um, the IOSS on packages over 150 euro. And um, again, we get back to what you mentioned, where individual countries doing something a little different from the EU as a whole and the difficulties that is for um, folks shipping from non-EU countries. You know, you need to have harmonization and and some uh, some standards that are for the entire EU community or it gets a little complicated. Uh, Kate, it's been great having you on the podcast as always. Kate, if people want to find out more about iMag, is there a website they should look at or a LinkedIn page or something? Go to the website, www.imag.world, and I'm all, you can find me on LinkedIn as well imag.world. I didn't know that was a world domain. I suppose you can do whatever you want now, can't you, with those domains? Yeah. Standardization, liberalization, <laughs> it's a theme that runs through everything. Kate Muth, Executive Director at iMag, thank you very much for joining us on the Post Hub podcast today. Thank you, Ian. My pleasure. Just a day or two after Kate and I spoke, back in late 2021, Senators Portman and Klobuchar, oh, I'm sorry, I really don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to say Klobuchar, it could be Klobuchar, who were the authors of the STOP Act, sent a letter to the White House and to the Secretaries of State and Homeland Security and to the Postmaster General, expressing concerns about the number of countries granted waivers from the STOP Act's AED requirements. So it looks like this issue will remain in the spotlight as US legislators push for more countries to be AED compliant. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Anna Merler Beave from Copenhagen Economics on postal reform, Angela Hultberg on outcomes from COP26, the impact on the delivery world, Helene Buleo Rai talks about the environmental impact of e commerce. Make sure you catch that one, very interesting. Brody Bueller from Ayrshire joins me to talk about cr- using data to create a high performing post. I mean, that's a great conversation as well, if I do say so myself. And Austin Reynolds from IPC joins me to talk about global postal industry trends. Now, I'm going to run out of time here, so I'm going to get straight to it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And when you subscribe to it, whether it's Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever, leave a review, leave a rating. It's great. It really helps if you could do that, please. So please leave a review, leave a rating for the podcast. Like a really high rating, obviously. If you're on LinkedIn, you can follow me on LinkedIn. You just find me on LinkedIn and click follow and you get my stuff in your feed. You don't have to connect with me or anything like that anymore. Uh, what else? Go to thepostalhub.com and sign up for my email newsletter or sign up for the Daily Delivery Digest as well. Poke around there, you'll find what I'm talking about. That's enough from me. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in and I look forward to your company next week on the Postal Hub podcast.